Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. And also by my 20-hour Yoga for Pelvic Health teacher training that is happening at Just Breathe Studio in Bermuda. I am so excited. This is happening March 6th to the 8th of 2020. Spaces in this training are limited. So if you are interested, go to the connectedyogateacher.com and look under trainings and events to find out more or to register. Welcome to episode 142 of the Connected Yoga Teacher podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow, a mother of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant who works for yoga teachers. And this podcast was created for you so that you can connect to information and inspiration every week and feel supported because I get it, connected yoga teachers. This can be a tricky business. Not only are you a small business owner or an entrepreneur, whatever you like to call yourself, but you're also a yoga teacher. And in my experience, yoga teachers love to focus in on their craft, how they are going to show up and teach yoga. And sometimes it's difficult to focus in on the business side of things. Also, I know that you are busy. You are driving to and from classes. You are checking your emails. You're doing your accounting, all of the things. And that is why I love to bring information like today's episode, where we're going to dive into the sutras in a way that you can listen to this in the car, while you're walking, while you're cleaning, while you're on the go, basically. In most yoga teacher trainings, we learn about the sutras. We know that it is the essential framework in yoga, but the reality is that it can be difficult to incorporate the sutras into our teachings and even into our own practice or our own life. Kelly DiNardo joins me on this episode today to share some practical strategies to apply the teachings of the sutras to our modern lives. Last year, Kelly co-authored Living the Sutras, a guide to yoga wisdom beyond the mat as a tool to make the other aspects of yoga as approachable and accessible as the asana is today. Kelly and I talk about her inspiration for this book, how to best translate the ancient wisdom found in the sutras into something accessible and relevant to today's world, and how to cultivate the mindsets, habits, and practices needed to live a joyful and purposeful life. If you've ever wondered how to bring more of yoga philosophy into your life, or you've wanted to use this in your classes or in your practice, this episode is a great place to start. All of our show notes are ready for you at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 142. There you can find the links that we talk about along with clickable timestamps. It is so easy to go back and really hone in on a specific topic in each episode. Before we dig into that, Connected Yoga Teachers, I want to share an email here from Christine. Christine sent this to me and she gave me permission to share it with you. The email reads, My name is Christine, and a few weeks ago, you and I spoke briefly prior to one of your fabulous Monday Q&A calls. At the time, I was torn as to what to do, and so I'm emailing you some results, but first, a big thank you. I actually have so much to say that I cannot contain myself, so here I go. Niching down is hard. Content planning is hard. Staying on task is hard. Asking for money is hard. But... I'm doing it all and staying with it no matter because you make complete sense. You resonate. I hear truth. And quite honestly, I'm tired of the constant struggle, being tired, etc. Your information is invaluable. Your podcast gives me the motivation I need to keep going. Thank you so much, Christine, for taking the time to write this email and then giving me permission to share it. What I really wanted to touch on were your very wise words that niching down is hard, content planning, staying on task, asking for money, all of these things are very difficult for all business owners, yoga teachers included. It warms my heart when I get an email like this or a review is left in iTunes or on our Facebook page or someone just sent me a voicemail and I will be playing it in a future episode. If you want to leave me a voicemail, I love them and I try and reply to each and every one. There's a button on our homepage over on the right hand side. Let's hear our hot tip of the week now from Schedulicity. Hello, Connected Yoga teachers. This is Allison with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Feng shui your yoga space by getting rid of appointment books, messy calendars, and stacks of sign-in sheets. Keep your business energy flowing with the new advanced marketing option. 
So Shannon, Blake asked you what you'd like to automate and you said everything. We agree. Now you can automate your thank you messages, birthday greetings, time to book reminders, and re-engagement discounts for people you haven't seen in a long time. Set and forget your preferences and stay even more connected with your clients. You can also promote your services and products at the time of online booking to add even more value to your clients' visits. If you're looking to attract more prosperity in your business life, add some elements of wood and water and check out advanced marketing. Okay, connected yoga teachers, let's meet Kelly. Kelly DiNardo is the owner of Past Tense Yoga Studio and also the host of the Living It podcast, which focuses on the realities of living your yoga practice. She's also the author of several books, and she's a freelance journalist. She contributed to the New York Times, O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, National Geographic Traveler, and many more. Kelly discovered yoga when she was procrastinating on a writing assignment, and yoga helped not only clear her writer's block, but sparked a new passion. Kelly has been teaching yoga for over 15 years, and back in 2009, she opened her own yoga studio in Washington, D.C., Her latest book, Living the Sutras, blends her passion for writing, yoga, and exploration. Let's dive in and meet Kelly. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. Kelly, it's great to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So I feel like I got into this rabbit hole of your bios in many different places. (laughs) And... I'm not even sure where to begin, but I am really excited that you're going to talk to us today about your book on living the sutras. And also, I just want to call to mind here for all of our listeners that you have been a studio owner for 10 years. I have. We just celebrated our 10-year birthday a couple weeks ago. So what got you into yoga in the very first place? Can you remember back to your first yoga class or your reason for wanting to do yoga? I don't remember my first yoga class. It was a long time ago. My parents were fairly progressive in that, and I'm sure it was in high school. I wasn't consistent in my practice until after college when I was living in the DC area and I was working at USA Today and USA Weekend Magazine, they had a fantastic gym. And I started going to one of the weekly classes they had there to counteract my long distance runs because I had started training for my first marathon. And I stayed on the mat for all the other reasons you stay on the mat besides, you know, looser hamstrings and counterbalancing long runs. So, (laughs) but that was when my practice became consistent. So, and then when did you start to get interested in the sutras? I feel like that doesn't come in, in your yoga classes a lot of the time. No, it doesn't. Right. So I was first introduced to the sutras in a weekend immersive teacher training module. And I think like a lot of people, I got the introduction. I, you know, we maybe spent a couple hours on it, an hour or two on it. And I put the book on my bookshelf and kind of let the book and the ideas in it grow dusty for a long time. For a long time, I was very much solely a physical practitioner. And slowly more and more of the philosophy started to make sense because of different amazing teachers that I've had. And one of those teachers is my co-author, Amy Pierce Hayden. And she gives really beautiful Dharma talks, honestly. I've there it's a it's a special skill and talent that she has. And she's the first one who really started to make the sutras interesting to the point where I wanted to learn more about them. So it's really only in the last four years that I've kind of dove into them in a, in a real way. And then you decided to write a book on them. Was that intimidating in any way? Oh my God. Yes. It was like getting my PhD (laughs) in the sutras. It was crazy. Um, yeah, but I, I think what Amy does in her Dharma talks is she makes the philosophy, notably the sutras, very modern and 
personally relevant. And as a writer, that is one of my goals is to make things easy for people, to make things accessible, to tell that story. And um, so it just seemed like a very a natural fit was to kind of take Amy's wisdom, absorb it as much as I, I could myself. And then we worked really hard together to kind of translate that into a way that makes sense in our modern world, right? And we added writing prompts so that people could make it personally relevant, which is what I think she does really well in her Dharma talks. That's amazing because you're right in that I think a lot of our listeners, a lot of yoga teachers hear about the sutras it feels really like this <laughs> this book that can be easy to put on the shelf and gather dust. Like it doesn't always feel like it relates to our life. And your book does an amazing job of really breaking it down, simplifying it, giving the translations. Uh, there's a lot in this book and it's not a difficult read. Thank you. That <laughs> was actually our goal. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> You know, I wanted to make it, we both wanted to make it so that people could relate to it and understand it. So there's a ton of neuroscience and psychology and social science in there. I'm absolutely certain we are the only yoga related book, certainly the only sutra book to talk about Fight Club or the talented Mr. Ripley or the cat in the hat, right? I mean, (laughs) these are ways to make it understandable. And I think that that is one of our jobs as teachers is to if we're living our practice off the mat, then yoga is everywhere for us. Right. And so where, where are these ways that we can find it and make it relatable and digestible for our students, whether it's the sutras or some other piece of philosophy, because, you know, I, I love the sutras, but I by no means think that that's the beginning or end of some really amazing yogic wisdom and philosophy. Right. So for our listeners who are like, wait a second, back this up. Maybe they missed it in their yoga teacher training. Maybe it wasn't there. Uh, Maybe they heard about it, but then quickly forgot about it. What are the sutras? Yes, that is a great question. So the yoga sutras is a collection of 196 aphorisms or sentences that were compiled by Patanjali. We don't know if Patanjali was a single person, if he was a group of people. We know very little about him. And he did not, this is not necessarily original material. He didn't invent yoga by any means, but he compiled it really. This is a a longstanding oral tradition, at least from our understanding. And basically what the sutras say is, they define what is yoga. They tell us all the ways we get in our own way and all the ways we cause trouble for ourselves in in achieving yoga because yoga is both the goal, the means, and the end in this system. And then Patanjali outlines the eight-limbed yoga system of it's the practice of yoga to help us actually achieve the ends of yoga. And so one of those limbs is our asana, our physical practice, But what I find really interesting is that it's actually less than 2% of the yoga sutras. (laughs) So (laughs) um, it's sort of an interesting thing. So that's the very like baseline nitty gritty on what what the sutras are. It's fascinating to me when you say that, that it's less than 2% Mm -hmm. in that we as a society who took yoga have made it such a focus. Mm -hmm that it really for some people is 100% or very high. I would definitely say for a lot of people, it's definitely over 50%. I I would think so. And, you know, that was how I came to the mat. And that was my practice for a long time. And I know there's some debate in the yoga community about why people come to the mat. And my feeling is that I don't really care <laughs> you know, you to the mat. And for me as a teacher, it's an opportunity to expand your idea of what yoga can be. And so if right now for someone, it's a physical practice, okay, I welcome the opportunity and the challenge to introduce you to what else it can be for you. Right. I think it's an amazing opportunity. 
One thing that you said in your book was to live the idea that yoga is a work in, not just a work out. I was like, oh, this is so good. So to me, that sentence says that all of a sudden we're going to start working inward, working on ourself. Was there ever a time where you were writing this book or reviewing the sutras where you thought, you know what, I'm done. I don't really want to do the work in, or have you seen that in some of the people that you work with or people who read this book? Yeah, I I think, I think that's probably part of why we do focus on the physical practice because it's, it's easier. It's an easy start to yoga and you get just enough of a glimpse on the mat of the potential that of the work in, in a way that's not really scary, that I think that that keeps people coming back, right? Because what happens on the mat is a reflection of what's happening off the mat. So if you're just dying in chair pose, what is your inner monologue, right? It's probably pretty similar to your inner monologue when you're off the mat and facing a challenge. And so if you've got a great teacher, then I think you start to pick up some ways of managing that, right? You feel more resilient in chair pose. And so you feel more resilient off the mat. And so I think, I think that that's part of why the asana practice is so popular, right? You get just enough of a taste (laughs) of what it could do. But yeah, the work in is the hardest part. And I am the first to admit Shavasana is my hardest pose. I struggle through it. I think about my to-do list. I think about all the other places I should be other than just on my mat. And meditation is a huge challenge for me. And and I think that's okay. And that I actually found incredibly reassuring in the sutras, the last three limbs basically describe the depths of meditation. And so even 2,000 years ago, the yogis knew that some days you were going to drop right into it, and some days you're going to be thinking about anything and everything else, right? Your mind would just go. If that was okay for them, then that's okay for me. And that gives me this level of permission to struggle with my meditation practice but it also means that I have to be consistent and regular with it, right? Because that's the only way I'll get over the struggle. So yes, I mean, I think the work in is hugely challenging and that's why we call it a practice. Right. (laughs) That's so good. So the way you've also designed your book is that it's divided into the three books. Do you want to tell us about that? Sure. So the sutras originally, the the original sutras, not living the sutras, <laughs> is um, four books or padas. And the first two and the first handful of sutras in the third book really talk about what yoga is, the tangible practice, that the actual work that we're doing. The latter part of the third chapter and the entire fourth chapter talk about the results of what happens when you achieve enlightenment. And there were two reasons that Amy and I focused on the first part of it. One is that neither of us have achieved a state of enlightenment yet. (laughs) (laughs) You have yet to write that book. (laughs) No. Yeah. So at some point, perhaps when we are levitating, we'll do that. And the other piece of it is, is that we wanted to really focus on the tangible practices of yoga and not the results, right? I mean, the results are amazing. We talk about them briefly in the introduction, but I think really we wanted to focus on the work in, not the results. Right. And so then can you tell us there's book one, book two, book three, and sort of what those all represent to you? Yeah, that's a great question. So book one is really the definition of yoga and what gets in the way. And then book two, it still takes a little while in book two to get to the practices, more of what gets in the way. And then the practices. And then the third book also talks about the meditation practices part of it. And for me, it's just a very slow walking inward, right? So I think right now, a lot of our focus is on you do you and I'm going to fix me and do the internal work. And then, then I can like 
be a productive person in, in the world and contribute or whatever, right? We work inward, outward, more or less in our society, I think, right now. And what I found really fascinating is that the sutras say the opposite, right? You start with the yamas, which is how you should act in the world, right? How you should treat other people and and your external behavior, even though it has massive internal ramifications too. (laughs) And then you get to the niyamas, which is how you treat yourself and how you should behave. And then you get to asana, which is, okay, well, let's start kind of thinking about this physical container that we all have. And then we go a little deeper inward through the breath. And that is really a gateway to kind of get inside. And then we're talking about you know, sense withdrawal and meditation, and we're really getting into the internal practices. And so for me, I thought that was fascinating, right? You know, sort of like make things right in the world as much as you can based on your behavior, right? And and then start to go deeper and deeper inward. Um, so that was really fascinating for me. That is. I've never heard someone explain it like that. And I feel like that makes it easier to start. And I feel like that's the first sutra, is it not? Like yoga is now? Am yes. I getting that right? <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. Yoga is now. So, and I love that because I think, you know, so many of us have Scarlett O'Hara mentality. Oh, like I'll start it tomorrow. I'll do it Monday. I'll, you know, let me do that. Right. No, it's, it's now. It's right in this minute. You and I talking, this is, this is yoga, right? How we are relating to each other. The other thing I love too is that, so the word ashtanga, which is the eight limbs, ashta means eight and anga can mean limbs or rungs. So you can think about it as either limbs of a tree, they're all coming off the same trunk and they're all branching out at the same time and they're all growing at the same time, maybe at different rates. Or you can think about it as rungs of a ladder that you might climb successively. So you can work the eight limbs in two different ways, right? It's not like you have to master the niyamas and the yamas and asana before you're allowed to focus on your breath or meditation, right? You're working all of these practices at the same time and you're going to move from one to the other or grow them at different rates and that's okay. But one shouldn't feel like they have to master headstand before they're allowed to do Kapali Bhati breathing or before, <laughs> before they can meditate, right? So we, we do it all the time, you know, all the pieces at the same time, which that's a lot too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I like this. I like this analogy that it's, we can work on them at the same time, but we can also like look at it as a progression. That's always been a question of mine. And sometimes I've heard people explain it like, you'll do that and that, and then slowly you'll reach enlightenment. One other question that I have is this whole yoga is now, when you said it, like us talking right now is yoga. So part of me thinks, cool, I'm doing yoga all the time. And the discipline part of me, the tapas thinks, "Mm, are you? And and it really kind of gets my back up a little bit if, and it's because of my own struggle with this, my own daily practice, I fall away from it often. So when I hear people saying, well, everything is yoga, I kind of think, wait a second, there needs to be this like set yoga practice. So I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Maybe it should be that everything can be yoga, but it isn't always yoga, right? So if I'm fully present and we're having this lovely conversation and we're learning from each other and then, well, that's self-study and that's being in the present moment. And there's so many pieces of yoga in that, right? But if I'm sitting here on my phone scrolling through Instagram while you're trying to have a conversation with me, that is for sure not yoga, right? Like (laughs) that is not following ahimsa, that is just plain root, honestly. So I think that there is an opportunity for yoga or a yoga mindset in in every moment. But I don't think we always do that because again, (laughs) if we were doing that, we would be enlightened. (laughs) And I don't know that many enlightened people. I actually don't think I know any, (laughs) which is not to say I don't know lots of wonderful people, but that's what we're working towards. 
Right. So I think that would be the distinction I would make with it. Oh, that's really good. Because I think there can be this temptation to, and it lives in me too. Sometimes I think, well, if I'm going out to my garden and I just have this real connection with what I'm doing in the moment and I'm focused on my breathing, like it's like a moving meditation for me sometimes, (laughs) not always, then I could say, okay, that's my yoga. Absolutely. But there's a part of me that thinks, is that Shannon? Is that really... I think so. I mean, if the, if you follow Patanjali's definition of yoga, which is yoga is the stilling of the fluctuations of the mind, right? So I love the Buddhist term monkey mind where your thoughts are jumping from, you know, one to another, like a monkey jumps from limb to limb. So if yoga is calming that craziness, calming the monkey mind, stilling those fluctuations, then you can do yoga and never do asana, or you can do asana and never do yoga. And when you're in the garden and your mind is calm and that's your meditation, then according to Patanjali, that's yoga, right? So if you get that feeling through a sweaty vinyasa class or coloring or meditation or running, whatever it is, that is your yoga practice. Now, there are lots of other definitions of yoga from other philosophers. So that's only if you (laughs) follow Patanjali, but I think it's a good place to start. That's amazing. Thank you. So then was there a point where you did some research or you were learning about something in this book and you thought, oh my gosh, if yoga practitioners or yoga teachers knew this, uh, I would love to get this piece of the message out to people. Not there wasn't a specific thing. I mean, I think for for us and for me, since I was far newer to the sutras than than Amy, I think what was really important was to kind of dust off the cobwebs. I think the there are some wonderful, wonderful translations that are out there. And I think once people have a an understanding, which I think our our book is the modern personal understanding. And then for those people who want to go deeper into it, there are some great, much more academic versions of the sutras. Our goal really was just to make this accessible to people. There's so much tangible information and practices in it, right? So I think that was really what we wanted to do. Right. Yeah. I like how you have like little reflections and really rooting it into daily life. And like, let's think about this. Like, let's see how we can apply it. That's one of my favorite things uh, when I started studying the eight limbs and I thought, how can I bring this into, into my reality? Cause otherwise it just feels like an idea. So that's fantastic. And then you also have a list of resources near the back as well. I saw Yes. So the list of resources is either things that we mentioned, other books, like we talk about the power of habit from Charles Duhigg and the flow state with Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. So we reference those and then we reference a few TED Talks. So all of that is in the back and the resources. And then just a straightforward reading of the sutras too without our commentary, which I think can be helpful as well. Yes, I really appreciated that when I turned there. And I need to ask you because my mind automatically skips over the Sanskrit because I haven't studied Sanskrit other than in my yoga teacher training. And I love how you've laid it out and then put the English there, but I do skip over it. Do you have any tips for yoga teachers who are feeling like, okay, the Sanskrit's hard for me, or I want to learn it, or do I need to learn it? What are your thoughts on the Sanskrit? I have really mixed thoughts on on all of it. I struggle with the like, am I studying a language? Is this cultural appropriation? All of those really big kind of heavy topics. I do think it's important to know it because, I mean, it is a language. And do I think it's as important as what the material itself is? I personally don't, but I'm sure I'll get taken to the mat on that by some other yogi. <laughs> and maybe I say that because I will fully admit that Sanskrit is my weakness. And even still, I'll say to Amy, okay, Amy, tell me again for like the 32nd time, how do you say that? And she'll, she's fantastic at that. 
it is something I would like to get better at. And there are some great online courses for that. And that is something that is in my kind of shorter term goals. So I love that you said that that's one of your weaknesses as well. I mean, we all have them. Yeah. And that you brought in the whole piece of like, is this a language? Is this cultural appropriation? This is something that, you know, is coming up a lot and it's worth having the conversation about it for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a handy book and it has a CD that came with it where it reads out the Sanskrit. Ooh, tell us what it is. Or will you put it in the show notes? So I'm not making you... I'll put it in the show notes and I'm pretty sure it's called The Language of Yoga. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It's handy. Okay. Unless you don't have a CD player. (laughs) 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 But maybe it's online now. Maybe it's like on an audio book. But I know that that's something that I turned to uh, when I felt like I needed to say something Mm -hmm. appropriately in Sanskrit. Yes. I have many great teachers that I follow who say different things in different ways. And I just have to remember, okay, well, I say niche and other people say niche and I say tomato. like Pronunciation. Yeah. Yeah. Pronunciation is a big thing as well. I think where it's important to know the Sanskrit is with things like the word ashtanga and the fact that Anga has two different meanings, right? That changes your understanding of what the eight limbs or the eight rungs are. And I think, so I think understanding the language is an opportunity to go deeper into the practice. So. I love that. And also it's an opportunity for like, let's say there's a yoga student who's going to an Ashtanga or Ashtanga yoga studio and they think, it's just a style of yoga. Right. You're like, wait a second. It's so much more than that. Right. Yeah. Right. It's confusing. It's confusing and hard. And it's okay to say that even as yoga teachers, we just because we're in the seat of the teacher does not mean we ever leave the seat of the student either. Right. I mean, I hope that I am always learning. I In my yoga studio, I hire teachers who are way better than I am because I want to practice with people who are better than I am. And I I always want to stay learning. And I think it's okay to admit when we don't know things. It's okay to admit when we struggle with things because how else are we going to progress? How else are we going to find people who can lift us up and help us learn? And um, I think we need to like shake off that pressure to be perfect all the time or to know everything. We're teachers. We're not gurus. It's okay. (laughs) That's so true. When And I I just want to highlight again that you said this is your weakness and you wrote a book about the sutras. Like you didn't think, okay, first I need to know how to pronounce everything correctly and understand every single thing before I can write the book, which would have been a big disservice to people who feel like they need a more tangible book on the sutras. So thank you for diving in. I'm sure there were times where you thought, oh, I should do that first. Or There were definitely times. I also, Amy, this was like the most beautiful collaboration too. Right? I mean, Amy has studied Sanskrit for a long time and she just knows it. And we would sit here in my office together and be like, okay, just talk to me. Don't worry about writing. Just tell me what this means. And, and then I would basically translate you know, what she's saying into kind of the written word. And then we'd go through together and edit and rewrite. But um, I mean, that's my skill as a journalist. In so many ways, I'm, I'm telling her story. And her story is this one of 20 plus years of Sanskrit study and sutra study in a way you know, I only had to do four years of <laughs> PhD study with Amy as my as my teacher, and and that's what and that's what I think why I think it's important to acknowledge what we don't know and be okay with it and find the people who can teach us because now I do know the sutras right like really well actually <laughs> <laughs> right even though I still struggle with the Sanskrit it's okay <laughs> that's amazing. I would love to hear how this has informed how you run a yoga studio 
for 10 years, which I want to say is a huge accomplishment. Like how do the sutras inform how you run a yoga business? That's a great question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. Well, I think that the sutras really, truly, I I think I was baby stepping off my mat in my practice and the sutras for a long time, I think I was taking these baby steps off my mat and understanding that it was this bigger thing that's more than down dog and pigeon pose. And the sutras just kind of firm kick in the pants on that. Like it's less than 2%. Kelly, get off your mat and practice it. And I feel like I live it in a different way, you know, and that's as a business owner, it's as a a mom, it's as a wife, it's as a friend and just a human being in the world. Like I feel like I am living my life very differently and that's an internal thing first, you know, and I, I believe in the sutras. I believe in the importance of a moral code. I believe in the importance of a physical practice, but hey, you know what? If I'm not getting to the mat as much as I'd like to, okay, the sutras are only 2% about that. It's okay, right? Like I believe in the importance of breath. I mean, how so few of us think about our breath until there's something wrong with it. And as somebody who has asthma, like that is not an insignificant thing to say, but I think about my breath differently. I still struggle with meditation, but at least I'm getting on the mat more consistent or in my seat more consistently. So it just changed everything for me. And and in terms of how I manage the studio, I think I'm, I think I'm a more patient and calmer person generally. I'm more willing to let go, which is not to say, because I think the hardest thing about running, the hardest and the best things about running a yoga studio are the people, right? So you have these amazing, wonderful teachers who maybe sometimes like flake out on classes and drive you crazy. (laughs) And you have these, this like amazing, wonderful community of students who maybe sometimes grumble because their pass expired whatever it is. Right. And so I find that I am much more, I'm much more able to grumble about a difficult student quietly to my manager and then very kindly and patiently deal with him or her, or I can grumble about something frustrating, whether it's like DC regulations or having to do all the admin work to my husband. And then I can just deal with it. Like this is just part of the practice and be disciplined and sit down and pay your sales tax, even though it's super not fun. (laughs) And, And then I can just kind of come back to the mat, um, whether that's actually physically on the mat or just like this calmer state. I do think I feel internally calmer than I did before. I don't know if my staff would necessarily (laughs) say the same thing. So I'll have to ask them. (laughs) Are there some tips or tricks that you would share with yoga teachers who are thinking about opening a yoga studio? Mm. Well, so I was kind of crazy. I had never worked or managed a yoga studio before I opened mine. I taught. Um, and so I went into it very naively. And in hindsight, I'm really glad I did because I think if I had known what I was getting myself into, I don't know if I would have done it. I, I wonder sometimes if fear would have gotten in the way. And that would have been heartbreaking because it is my like my community and my home in so many ways. I have so much joy in my life because of past tense. Um, So I think the first thing is don't let fear get in the way of what you want to do, but also be realistic about it too. I really thought that I'd be clean in toilets and fold in blankets. And I do all of those things, that all of those things have happened. 
There is a hilarious hyperlapsed video of me stamping the floor so people know where to line up their mats floating around somewhere. (laughs) Um, You know, it's not always glamorous. But most of what I spend my time on is the people. So if you're not a people person or you're not prepared for that, just think about it. Just know that that's what it is, you know? And and the people are what bring me the most joy and the people are what cause the most headaches. It's just kind of the way life is, whether you're in a yoga studio or at the grocery store. Um, and then the last thing, I don't know, the last tip is um, I think... I think there I two I think two other thoughts. I think there are a lot of really talented yogis and then I think there are some talented business people and I think it's rare when that overlaps and I think it's important to have a a business professional mindset if you're going to run a studio and I don't think there's any shame in that. I think there's a lot of a lot of yoga teachers beautifully think that this is a life of service and we don't like to talk about money, but you can't, you physically cannot do what you do if you are not making an actual living. If you are not organized and managing things like a professional, like a business person. And if the thought of blending business and your yoga life like if that gives you anxiety, I would say, think about that. You know, maybe it's, that doesn't mean you can't open a studio, but maybe it's finding a partner who's good with the business side of things. So, um, I treat the studio and my staff professionally and the way I would want somebody to treat me. And I think that that's gone a long way. I think that's a big part of why we're still here. That's amazing. I love how you brought in this business mindset and it's important to have as well. I hear sometimes in threads in our Facebook group or in talking to yoga teachers, this frustration of like, I don't want to market. I don't want to sell. It feels against all of the yoga principles. Yeah. Yes. I get that. I get that. So I'm going to suggest all those people go read Rod Stryker's Four Desires. He talks about this a lot about, you know, and one of the desires, um, and I'm going to kind of forget the Sanskrit name coming back to our earlier conversation. (laughs) Um, But one of the desires is having the means to live your purpose. So if your purpose is to teach yoga, then you have to have the means, the physical healthy body, the financial means. If we, you and I believe that having this conversation is fulfilling our dharma in some way and helping other yoga teachers, the technology we're using to have this conversation is part of the means. So maybe it's a simple shift in perception of like, yeah, I know you don't want to market it. I know you don't want to sell it. It's, it can feel icky, but that is the means to live your purpose, to do what you're doing. And again, if that's something that you struggle with, find someone who is good at it, right? Like, you know, we've got a fantastic social media manager at Past Tense because that is, again, not my strong point. I don't enjoy doing it, but I understand that that's important, right? So, and that's also not the only way to market yourself, to market your studio. And so, I mean, when I when I opened Fast Dense, we printed out thousands of postcards and literally went door to door throughout our neighborhood. I went to the farmer's market every week and was just a physical presence to say, hi, this is what we're doing. So there are other ways to do it that might feel less uncomfortable for people. So I would say, remember that this is one of the means to achieving your dharma and the other piece of it is figure out the way that makes you feel less crummy about it and and or find someone to partner with right oh that's so good maybe it's their dharma to help you get the word out (laughs) and it always is i think sometimes we think well i don't like doing that Mm -hmm. you know we don't feel guilty if we're like passing something over to a plumber or to our dentist or to our accountant, like that's their thing. They've decided 
that's my dharma. This is my work. This is how I make a difference. Absolutely. And then we don't question that person either if no. they have an advertisement that tells us about their service. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And go read Rod Stryker's book. It's I, that it was a huge perception shift for me, kind of understanding that. And you let go of the guilt once you know that, right? Did you interview him on your podcast? This I is the did. the first episode. It was the first episode. And um, he, it was, there's so much wisdom in it, so much wisdom. And he, it's changed kind of how I think about things even more. And his voice is just lovely. But he has this wonderful app called Sanctuary where he does these gorgeous meditations and I could just listen to him. He's meant to be on, on radio and on podcasts. He's got just a beautiful voice. Well, so. something in that episode, he was talking about power and feeling mm-hmm. uncomfortable with the thought of power and the way he talked about it, it really shifted my perception. So mm-hmm. I'll make yeah. sure to link to that in the show notes. Thank you. Now I remember what it was. Are you going to do an audio book of this book? We ha- have not talked to Shambhala about that, but we are doing a card deck that will be, it's its new information that's in it. So, um, so it's not a repeat of the book, but it is in line with the book. So there'll be three different styles of cards. There'll be a philosophy card, um, a practice and a meditation card. And so you can, and they're on different themes. So you can just pick one card and have your practice for the day. You can pick all three cards on the same theme, or you can mix and match however you want to do it. So we are working on that. And uh, I will ask Shambhala about whether or not we're doing an audio book. (laughs) It would be amazing. I feel like then we could get the Sanskrit and the, yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. (laughs) Look at me like, that's what I would like. Yeah. (laughs) And so since you've written this book now and it's out there and people are reading it, is there some feedback that you've gotten that was surprising for you or something that has come from publishing this book? No, actually. I think it surprised some people, including, I think, honestly, including Shambhala, because it's been so well received. But I knew as a teacher that this is what was missing for me. And I don't have a big enough ego. I know if I feel that way, then I'm probably not the only one. I'm not the only one who's ever had this experience in life. I'm not surprised at how well it's done and been received in the yoga community. I think what I am surprised about is that there are people who are interested in it who are not yoga teachers, right? I think speaks to the need for this level of philosophy and the interest in yoga beyond just as a physical practice, which gives me a lot of hope and joy to think that we'll get there and remember that it's not all gorgeous Cirque du Soleil like <laughs> photos on Instagram. <laughs> well, what I really like is that I could see this being like a book club for a yoga class. Or, you know what, your yoga teacher training, your 200 hour is super overwhelming. All the things you need to remember, just like pick this up and it's easy to pick up and just read one little part of it. So, yeah. Well, and I'm actually in the process of putting together an online course to go through it. Um, And I, while it's not just geared towards yoga teachers, I am going to set it up so that for yoga teachers who are interested it'll be, it'll have Yoga Alliance CEUs attached to it. Nice. So that I'm hoping, I'm planning on launching in the fall. So if folks are interested in that, drop me a line. I'll make sure. In fact, anybody who's interested in that, tell me you heard about this on the Connected Yogi and I'll send you a discount code for it even. So that would be um, amazing. Maybe we'll figure out how to put it in our show notes then. Okay. We'll figure it out. Okay. (laughs) That's fantastic. Yes. I've got a rough outline for it. And now I just need to work on the technology piece of it. Again, the means. And because, again, not my talent, know when to ask for help, know it's okay to ask for help. I, I'm working with a great company called Namastream. So hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've heard of Namastream. Fantastic. So again, that's their dharma, not mine. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
That's amazing. So one other kind of unrelated question. I see that you have quite a bit of writing published in various places and some really prominent magazines and online places. Do you have any tips for people who think, well, I want to write an article. How do I submit it? How do I get my foot in the door? Yeah, I, that's a great question. So, if I would say start small and work, you know, mark, work your way up. I always knew I wanted to be a writer, and when I was in high school, I worked for a teeny tiny local newspaper covering town planning meetings, which is exactly as boring as it sounds. <laughs> And I got paid a whopping $25 a story. It was so awful. But I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So find a blog, find a website. Those are usually easier than magazines and newspapers to break into. I would say try and avoid writing for free. I think, again, what we do in our work has value. So there's... um, a great website called mediobistro.com and there's freelancesuccess.com and they and there's some uh, Facebook groups and they're great collections of writers and I forget what they're called, like basically media sheets that will tell you what different publications are looking for and what they pay. And you know what? Some of them are going to pay 10 cents a word, but when you're starting out, that's okay. You're still getting paid. All I'm saying is know your value. Um, So I would start with that. And the other piece of it is um, generally when you're pitching, you pitch an idea, not the whole story. So don't feel like you've got to have the the pressure to flesh out an entire story. Um, You really need, depending on the length of the story you're going for, you know, three to 10 sentences that kind of outline what you want to be writing about. So I think those would be really good first steps. Take writing courses, build the writing community, ask for help, ask for mentors. Um, It's not that dissimilar to starting your yoga practice, right? It's discipline and consistency and good teachers and good guides. That's amazing. Thank you so much for answering that. It's unrelated and very related because it means that you published a book. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. I will make sure that I put the links in the show notes. And where do you think is the best place for people to go if they want to find out more from you? So probably my website, which is kellydenardo.com. If they want information on the podcast, that website is living at podcast.com. I'm on Instagram at Kelly Donardo. So people, if you're unsure of where, which of the 85 things I'm doing, you can find me there and I will DM you back. I promise. So that's always a good place to find me. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. This was really delightful. Okay, Connected Yoga Teachers, how was that? Thank you again so much, Kelly, for sharing all of your wisdom and just being really open and honest about what your life has been like as a writer, what it was like to write this book, and the many thoughts that you have about what yoga means to you and how you interpret the sutras. Connected Yoga Teachers, I would love to hear from you. I think this is a conversation really worth having. How can we live our yoga? How can we bring the sutras into our daily life, into our yoga practice, and into our classes? So if you are already bringing the sutras in somehow in your life, leave a comment for us. You can find the show notes at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 142. And also you could start a conversation in the Connected Yoga Teacher group if you'd like to. As I'm recording this episode today, I just went outside and took a photo of the fall leaves on the trees. And by the time you're listening to this episode, I'm guessing we will have no leaves left on the trees. (laughs) But some exciting news. I am traveling to Bermuda a couple of times. And one of those times, I'm wondering if you'd like to meet me there and study some yoga for pelvic health. So I will be there March 6th, 7th, and 8th, and a little bit of time before and after as well to enjoy the sunshine for a 20-hour in-person training at Just Breathe Studio hosted by Samantha. I've already been to this place. It's 
beautiful. It's amazing. If you have any questions about this training or you want to find out how to register, go to the connectedyogateacher.com and look under trainings and events. Thank you so much to our entire team for making today's episode possible. And thank you, dear listener. Your time is valuable. It means a lot that you hang out and you tune in and have a listen. So I want to know, Connected Yoga Teachers, before I sign off, what will you be doing this week to stay connected? And maybe that means bringing the sutras in a little bit more. So how will you stay connected to yourself to your yoga practice and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up.